is known I was adopted. My mom regularly said if I ever wanted to find birth parents, she would help. I never wanted to. I took righteous pride in being chosen to hide my deep-seated sense of non-belonging. In third grade, I first felt the yawning disparity of my rootlessness. It was the day we discussed our ethnic origins. I heard voice after voice declare, I'm Italian and French, or my dad came from Ireland. I sat frozen. When it was my turn, I stammered, I don't know. I was adopted. My teacher was completely unprepared. The silence echoed with my otherness. Eventually, she broke the quiet with evasion and said only, Okay, let's keep going. I felt utterly alone, and I never told my parents about that day. Growing up, the only information I had was on a tiny chart from the adoption agency. On one side it said mother, the other father. There were a few minor factoids, brown hair and eyes for both, skin tone, height, weight, age, a bit of education for both of them, their parents, and she was mostly English. All I had to establish my roots was nothing. I armored up my retort to, where's your real mom, was usually pointed. My real mom is at work right now. Do you need me to call her? I would say to, with defiance to mask my insecurity. I loathe that question. When I was in my early 20s, an adoptee friend of mine who knew a ton more about herself encouraged me to contact my adoption agency for more additional non-identifying information. I hated how little I knew, so I decided to call. I was told it would take some time, but yes, I could get some more information. It took so long, I forgot about my request. Over a year later, I came home to a letter. My hands shook as I opened it. On the top of the first page was the same chart, only this one had more information. My eyes moved over the page, devouring words like a starved dog. I absorbed first names, Linda, Robert. Oh, my birth parents are real. I hastily scanned, seeking nuggets of new information until I got to the bottom. There, unmistakably, it said that Linda had married in 68. I was born in 69. Why was I adopted? After the chart was a narrative. Disappointingly, it didn't have any ethnic or medical background, but it did explain my adoption. Linda had broken up with Robert before she knew she was pregnant. She started dating another guy, and then she realized she was pregnant by her ex. The new boyfriend, boyfriend was willing to raise me as his own, so they got married. But then Linda decided they were too young, and the baby needed a better opportunity. So I was put up for adoption. Besides her and her husband, only her mom knew whose child she'd actually carried. Linda decided to tell everyone, I died at birth. I was 25 at the time, rife with youthful self-righteousness. I thought, she killed me. I filed the documents with disdain and remained proudly rootless. In 2011, I was in therapy. One day, my therapist, out of any relevant context, blurted, I want you to consider finding birth parents. I narrowed my eyes at her. She said, I know you don't want to, but if you find anyone, it will be grounding. I said, I don't want to do that. She repeated her counsel, even suggesting I ask my friend Kim, who had referred me to her, what she thought of the idea. Ah, I thought, Kim had found her birth mom and it was awful. She will tell me no, and then I can ignore the advice. I called Kim right away. Oh yeah, she said. That was really awful. You should do it. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> when I got to work that day, I thought, since I pay the damn therapist, I should at least consider it. I went online to determine what a search would require before deciding any action. 
I quickly verified my records were sealed. There was a mutual consent contact form that I printed with no intention of submitting. I found a search firm that was probably stupidly expensive. Finally, I came on a site with a searchable database. Bingo! No commitment from me needed. But I had to create a profile. With reluctance, I put in a few details about me and hit submit and found nothing. There. I'd considered it. 20 minutes was enough. I'd have, I had work to do and I wasn't into this. Another 20 minutes later, my cell phone rang from an unknown caller. I watched the screen in trepidation as it chimed, and then stared at it until I got a mo voicemail notification. Part of me didn't want to retrieve it, but I couldn't help myself. Hi, my name is Judy. You just filled out a form for the nonprofit I work for. I wanted to call because, well, I wanted you to know I'm a real person. I'm going to send you an email, but I think I have some information for you, if you can call me back. I hate phone calls. But before I could think about it, I called back. And it was immediately clear she'd found my birth mother. Judy's email contained a link to a classmate's page with a picture She'd given me possible addresses and numbers for Linda, who lived in Oceanside. There was also the date of birth of another child, Jenny. I spent three months debating and internet sleuthing. Okay, it was cyberstalking. I just wanted to learn everything I could before deciding if I was going to contact Linda. I dove deep. As Linda's online presence was limited to what I'd been sent, I switched to Jenny. I eked out information on her from her college years, but not a lot. She apparently heeded lessons about protecting her cyber presence. <laughs> but from that meager find, I discovered her husband's name, and then his blog. And from the list of his followers, her blog. I read every entry hungrily. Did she know about me? If I made contact, would I destroy her world? Destroy Linda's? And oh my god, they're Baptist! What if they're Westboro types and despise me for liking women? What should I do? I tried to leave it alone, but would find myself drawn back to my hunt. Kim played the what-if game with me. What if I call and destroy her life, I said. Kim retorted. What if she tries to suck you in like her long-lost child? That was terrifying! I was so conflicted, but so intrigued. What ultimately decided it was the realization that my holes were no longer just mine. Turning my back on the opportunity to learn more would mean condemning my six-year-old daughter to the same lack of information. I called Kim and said, Okay, fuck it. You said you'd make first con contact, let's do it. That Saturday in May of 2011 will always stand out in my mind. I was planted on Kim's patio as she called from inside. I did not want to be in the room. And hell no, she could not tell Linda I was there, much less hand the phone to me. A lot of time passed. I grew more nervous and more calm. Finally, Kim walked out, toting champagne and glasses. She poured as she replayed the conversation for me. Hello, is Linda available? This is Linda. My name is Kim. I have a friend who lives here in San Diego. She was adopted. Recently, she came upon some information and thinks it's quite likely that you're her birth mother. Linda, are, are you okay? Take a moment. I understand. It's a lot. Could you please repeat what you said? Kim repeated her opening statement and added, She was born on February 22nd, 1969. Uh-huh. And would have been named Wendy. Uh-huh. You married John in 68. Uh-huh. Linda, are you okay? After she recovered a little, a little, Linda's first words were, Is she okay? 
I listened to Kim describe the rest of the call enraptured and dazed, almost hearing without hearing. Suddenly my brain processed what she'd said at the end. Kim had made arrangements for me to call Linda the next day. This was all suddenly moving at a terrifying speed. I drank a lot of champagne. Kim had to drive me home. The next day I was a mess, a bizarre soup of anxiety anticipation. I cleaned my house in a frenzy that only extreme stress evokes in me, finishing one ta half finishing one task before moving to another and back again. I didn't want to call at the appointed time for fear it would seem too eager. I waited an additional 20 minutes and then called. We talked for over an hour and a half. I took notes, asked and answered questions, and swam in my new Twilight Zone existence. Linda didn't push and was willing to answer my questions with a disarming frankness. That melted my standoffishness a little. I gave her my number, but she made it clear she wouldn't call unless I did. I tossed out, did you want to meet? With enough tone that she said, only if you do. I said, I'd think about it. The next day, I got a Facebook message from Jenny. It sent me into a strange mix of panic and intrigue. Far from ruining Jenny's life, she'd known about me since she was 18 and was desperate for her mom to find me. She'd always wanted a sister. I wanted to run, but instead I replied? <laughs> that began a whirlwind. Jenny and I started exchanging emails, and I shocked myself and I asked Linda to meet, which we did just six days after our call. Meeting Linda was one of the most bizarre moments of my life. I was terrified. I painstakingly planned my outfit going for edgy to avoid being swallowed up, but I also desperately wanted connection and roots. We hugged awkwardly, both visibly anxious. She handed me a gift, nervously saying, it's just a small thing because I've never been able to. We talked for several hours, cautiously at first, and then with growing comfort. She brought me photos of herself and Robert, I shared a childhood photo album with her. I was struck by how similarly we spoke. We have the same sense of humor. And we've both been ruled by the same fear about interfering in the other's life just to learn more. Jenny and I continued our virtual dialogue, sending progressively longer messages. In July of that year, she came to town and we met for the first time. Being around Jenny was as natural as breathing. While I grew up liberal, agnostic, and with opportunity, she grew up, she was right-winged, Christian, and relatively poor, but we're wired so similarly, it's crazy and utterly amazing. For a while, I struggled with all of this. I felt disloyal to my mom, dad, and brother. I didn't want them to feel rejected, but I now had an awareness of how different I am from them. Simultaneously, I fit so easily with Linda and Jenny, but had jarring moments where I didn't because of upbringing. My daughter showed me the way. For her, it's all family. My family's of upbringing and origin. When I announced to her in October of this year that we were going to spend Thanksgiving in Colorado with Jenny and her family, she literally jumped up and down with excitement. This was a big first for me, a holiday with that family, with that piece of family, of my family. I was so scared to tell my parents where I was going for Thanksgiving, and both surprised me. Their delight for me and my daughter was absolutely clear. And I'd worried I would feel estranged in Jenny's house, unsettled for not having my family and our traditions, Far from it, I didn't notice any lack. We talked from the mundane to the life-altering. I cried as I shared about sorrows both current and from childhood. We laughed a ton and sang a 
Apparently my propensity to respond to the moment with a line or two or a song is a genetic trait. <laughs> Jenny's kids and my daughter bonded and played with a natural ease that's something to be cherished. And I now use the word sister in regards to Jenny. When it came time for us to return home, everyone was bummed. I'll likely always have these moments of fitting and not in both family situations. And that's just part of what makes me, me. But I'm blessed to have two families who love me and my daughter. And my therapist was right. <laughs> that's Kelly Bowen, everybody!